reading. I'm going to meet some single women who, in the cold light of day, are choosing the attributes they want to mate with and hope to pass on to their children. Is it even possible that kindness, altruism, is one of the things they go for? Hi. Hello, you must be Stacy. Yes, I am. Welcome. I'm Richard. How Very nice you? to meet you. Come in. And this is... These women want to become mothers through a sperm donor. It's a kind of high-tech sexual selection. Did, did you think you were choosing a man that you yourself yeah, might absolutely. have been attracted to? Absolutely. Yes. I mean, it's a little bit, I joke, it's a little bit like going on Match.com. You yes. pay for a three-month membership and you look at the photos. <laughs> and, you know, I know some women that look at it that way. You know, you're looking for healthy, attractive, fit and intelligent. So I would want those qualities for my child, the same qualities I would want in a partner. Right. They're appealing for people in general. Yes. That's at least that's how I look right. at it. For the women's potential partners, partners whom they never meet, the process begins here. Down here we have the donor rooms where, you know, they can uh, do their thing. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to put Suitable both. pictures on the wall. Oh, of course, you've got to have a lot of inspirational material to help it along, you know. <laughs> but who are the women going to pick? The same type of room. Are there any women who say, well, just give me something at random? Very, very, very rarely. OK. <laughs> Tell me a woman that has walked into a shoe shop and said, uh, just give me whatever you have. <laughs> that doesn't happen, you know. You, no, that's right. Yeah. I mean, I'm Anything interested you buy, you, you, you spend time on your, on your decision. That's right, of course. But yeah. I mean, we kind of in our society pay lip service to the idea that there's something taboo yeah. about eugenic yeah. choice. Yeah. And so you might think that the women might as it were, go along with that and say, well, no, I don't approve hey, of eugenic, so, so I am not it's, it's America. It's a, it's a satiety yeah. of, of consumption and, and, uh, and consumerism. People are used to, uh, you go online, you buy products, you ask questions about the products. Yes. And, um, Donors have to provide full and intimate details of all aspects of their life. Shoe size and allergies and skin tone, if he tans easily. Mm, there, was, there was one that caught my eye. 6'1", um, hazel eyes, curly brown hair. Favorite pet dog. Favorite pet. <laughs> if he's a smoker. He likes James Bond. Uh, he, li and he, uh, he likes Aston Martin. He likes jazz music. But I want to return to the enigma of altruism. Is it possible that among the qualities women want in a sperm donor is niceness, kindness? I'm interested in this donor because um, he explained that someone in his family had difficulty getting pregnant and so it was important to him to be able to um, help others who um, were in need of um, assistance in that area. So I like that. What's fascinating is that the women don't just want the obvious alpha male qualities. You know, that there's so many things that goes into it than just looks and or intelligence. One of the donors that have been really popular is actually the nicest guy. And I don't know how you put that in a formal, but he's the nicest guy. Yes. He's not the smartest guy. Yeah. He's not. He's not the best looking guy. So how I, do I, they I, know? How do they know he's the nicest well, guy? He, from his. He actually. He's actually written a really good extended profile okay. about yeah. himself. So I've actually met know. the guy. Mm. That I can tell you the profile actually checks out. He is a really nice guy. So what's going on here at a more fundamental level? This goes back to an old interest of mine. I became fascinated by the issue of how animals evolved to be nice when I started teaching biology at Oxford in the 1960s. This was barely 10 years after the structure of DNA in genes had first been cracked by Watson, Watson and Crick. And I was intrigued how the new science of genetics could help provide an answer to the puzzle of altruism. Genes are coded instructions that build every living thing, body and mind. They give rise to the distinctive family nose down through the generations. They dictate what color eyes you have. But such examples are just the outward and visible tip of the iceberg. 
Now here's the point. We organisms, you, me, an octopus, a forget-me-not or a giraffe, are survival machines. We're vehicles for the genes that ride inside us, vehicles that are thrown away after we've handed the precious coded information on to the next generation through reproduction. Genes are copied from one generation to the next, on and on. So they, and they alone, are immortal. I advocate a kind of genes eye view of nature. The genes that survive are the ones that consistently provide slightly longer necks, slightly keener eyes or improved camouflage, and so help their vehicle to survive and therefore pass those same genes on. The survival of the fittest really means the survival of genes, because it is only genes that really survive down through many generations. A gene that didn't look after its own interests would not survive. That's the meaning of the phrase, selfish gene. OK, so how can selfish genes support kindness? If genes are striving selfishly to make more copies of themselves, how can a gene achieve this selfish objective by making its bearer behave altruistically? One part of the answer is kinship. An altruistic gene can spread through the population so long as the altruism is directed at other organisms that have the same gene. In other words, at family. So, selfish genes build parent animals who protect their young, in human terms, parents who'd rush into a burning building to save their children. This is called kin selection. The other part of the answer is reciprocal altruism. You scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. When animals live in groups where they encounter each other repeatedly, genes for returning favors can survive. Individuals sacrifice themselves for each other. They give food to each other, to close kin, and to other individuals who might be in a position to pay back favors on another occasion. Selfish genes give rise to altruistic individuals. In the 70s, I wrote a book bringing these ideas together called the selfish gene. The idea that altruism ultimately boils down to a survival game for genes raised hackles, but it's now widely accepted among biologists. But it's not the end of the story. I realized there really does seem to be something odd about humans. Aren't humans rather nicer than even the theory of the selfish gene would expect? We donate to charity, give blood, weep in sympathy at the plight of complete strangers. Now, I want to explore why. I've been struggling all my life with why people should be quite so kind and decent to each other. At first glance, it seems to go against the dog-eat-dog -dog viciousness of Darwinism. To be sure, Darwinism was softened because it was in the selfish interests of genes to build altruistic animals. There are good genetic reasons for limited acts of kindness. But 